Now, it's impossible to let light shine. God's people, when they adore him unabashedly with this exceeding joy, are bold to speak and bold to worship. In his presence there is fullness of joy at his right hand pleasures evermore. And I can't forget who's at his right hand. These pleasures are not just from God, but they are in God. Now that light is rescued for God's assessment. We've had several assessments by God, all true, in Scripture. I'm not sure we've had this one yet, but Jeremiah. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, for my people committed two evils. Forsaken me, the fountain of the living waters, and instead hewed cisterns that hold no water. Broken cisterns. That's, in other words, the essence of evil is to turn from God and try with every toy, try with every job, try with every relationship, every entertainment, every recreation, every project, Every religion, as the world uses it, and every church, as the world uses that, to find satisfaction. That, this is what God, when he shines that light, he'll rescue from it. His light's designed to remove all of that, and that suicidal love affair with everything but him, Amen. and put himself back into your circumcised heart. His light's designed to do that. That light raised you from the spiritual dead. We were dead. Trespasses and said, God made you alive. That is, when he shines your light into his heart. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him. So right between God making us alive and raising us up, grace gets just thrown right in because that's the light that allowed him to raise you from the dead. Note the God-centeredness of all of this is my point. God made you alive. If he didn't, it wouldn't be done, as you well know. Now, God's light seen in his effectual call. I know there's a general call. But this call was not according to our works, but according to his own good pleasure. The God-centeredness. That's when he made his light to shine in you. A new creation really happens when God makes his light to shine in you to the one that is blinded. Let there be light. And he creates in a darkened heart the light of the knowledge and glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice the God-centeredness of the cross. Oh, everybody gets together and who crucified Christ and we got Roman soldiers and we got Pilate and we got Herod and we got uh, the mob and all of that. I'm talking about the God-centeredness of this. When God gave his son to be a propitiation. For us. He did it. Amen. It was God that did it. Why? To demonstrate his, that's God's own righteousness. In order that he, God, might both be just and justify them who have faith in Jesus. The God-centeredness of all of this is overwhelming to me. And, you know, the wonderful discussion of elections in Ephesians, the first chapter, and the Romans, the ninth chapter. No matter what controversy exists on it, the one thing that rings clear to me is in Romans, the ninth chapter, which states, it was all in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. He made his light to shine in those vessels of, more, of, of glory, vessels of mercy. Now, of course, I know there are vessels of wrath, but I ask myself the question, will not God's mercy shine even brighter against that backdrop of judgment? Possibly so. And as we come to more and more into this light and move from glory into glory, Will not the intensity of our joy, for every time God reveals himself, my joy goes up, Amen. becomes greater and greater as we see a fuller range of God's perfection in the history of redemption. And our brothers before me have really brought that to light. And so as you leave 
tonight, surely your joy is going to be greater. Thus I conclude in the God-centeredness of this light shining. There are two great passions in the universe, and they do not have to collide. God's passion to be glorified and my passion to be satisfied. And in the end, God is most glorified in me, and I am most satisfied in him. Now, all of this, the verse says, is in the face of Jesus Christ. Which, of course, he quickly means that's in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, quickly, the scripture says, you know, Jesus is appointed servant to display the glory of God, starting right over there in Isaiah. Uh, the scriptures call him the Lord of glory. It means he's in charge of it. It calls him the King of glory, which means, of course, he's the supreme being of it all. And he's, uh, uh, get to the bottom line, if you know Jesus, you know God. And if you have Jesus, you have God. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. Uh, but having said that, the scripture makes a big point about in the face of Jesus or in the face of God. Adam and Eve lost that face-to-face -face relationship. That means they just simply lost their personal relationship with God. See, on their part, they hid. Well, you can't hardly hide to have a relationship. On God's part, the sin separated them. That's a twofold problem here. Well, I, I love the deal about Cain. You know, he, he's kind of, we think of him maybe as the epitome of evil. The punishment of Cain, God says, I'm going to drive you from my face. Mm -hmm. And Cain says, I, 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 I can't bear it. Cain had more acute awareness yeah. of the situation that people do today. I cannot this is more than I can bear. Judah, uh, Jacob, excuse me, declared his life preserved because God had blessed him face to face. Moses, of course, we always use his great face to face relationship with God. God expressed it even this way to Aaron. And let me teach you how to pray. Make my face to shine on you. Be gracious to us. Lift up my countenance upon you, says God. Now I'll give you peace. <laughs> Moses in his little discussion with God when God was going to kind of wipe them all out, he reminded him, he said, you know those Egyptians over there believe that we have a face-to-face -face relationship with you. This is important. Have a face-to-face -face relationship with God. Moses reminded the Israelites later on that God removing himself, that is his face from them, that'd bring all manner of evil. He kind of saw it like Cain did. This isn't going to work. Now there's a beautiful psalm. It's not in the book of Psalms. It's in 1 Chronicles 16, chapter 26 verses of it. Called it a psalm. There David extols the glory of God and man's reaction to that glory. But right in there, he admonished the people. He said, y'all seek the face of God forevermore. Hezekiah and rallying the people to keep the Passover admonished the people these words, for the Lord God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you'll return to him. Many did, and the hand of God was to give them one heart. It's, it's great. Elihu, <laughs> oh, that great character in the book of Job. I tell you, I, I, can't, I like him. I, he, he was the first man who really could